So welcome everybody. Hi, um, you're here for uh, which was a three hour program that premiered in the spring on public media stations around the country. Uh, the film dramatically reveals how water underpins every aspect of our existence. And um, there are many resources, classroom appropriate resources that are standards aligned that you're going to see tonight that are drawn from the, uh, the broadcast. This session is uh, sponsored by GBH, uh, which is um, part of GBH, Boston's public media station. Uh, GBH is a major producer of programs that you see on stations all across the country. Programs like uh, Masterpiece, Nova, American Experience, Frontline, Antique Roadshow are all produced by, WG, by GBH and then lots of kids programs. And the session is also sponsored by PBS Learning Media. PBS Learning Media is a free site offering thousands of digital resources for K-12 across the curriculum. Um, you are welcome to browse the site without signing in, uh, but sign up is free. And if you do so, then you can make full use of the site and download resources, save them to folders, have your students save their work, etc. So we encourage you to uh, create an account on the site if you haven't already uh, do, uh, done so. Excuse me. <coughs> on the site, you will find um, resources such as short clips drawn from full length public television programs like NOVA, uh, lesson plans, teaching tips, interactive activities, etc. Thousands of things for you to watch. All right, I'm Carolyn Jacobs, I'm part of the GBH Education Department. And our presenters this evening are Sean Stevens, who is the Director of STEM Curriculum and Instruction, also a GBH Education. Toby Heyman, the Director of Film and Video at the Nature Conservancy. Toby McElhaney, Media Producer at GBH Education. What's the chance of having two Tobys as presenters? And Nancy Gifford, a Science Teacher at Monomoy Middle, High, Middle School in Chatham, Mass. Hi, Carolyn. Um, sorry, quickly to interrupt. There are some crackling noises happening in the background. I don't know if it's from, um, I don't think it's our presenters, but wondering if our, um, if our participants have their, have their mic on? No, the participants should not have their mic on. So um, maybe it'll just go away on its own. Do you hear it now? Not now. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Hopefully. Carry on. <laughs> hopefully it will not come on. Thank you, Matul. Um, and Nancy, I just wanted to mention that Nancy also, um, aside from being a middle school uh, teacher and a teacher advisor for GBH, she was also the 2018 Massachusetts Science Teacher of the Year. And uh, we're very happy to have her with us. Um, Matul, whose voice you just heard talking about the crackling sound is in the background. Matul is also part of the GBH Education Department and she will be populating the chat um, and also looking at the Q&A if you're posting any questions uh, to make sure that you get all the links you need and that you're able to um, chat with each other and with the presenters. Um, just, that's just a reminder that we are recording and also that um, only the presenters have the microphone and also the uh, video camera. So the plan is that uh, Sean is going to kick things off and talk a little bit about the program, The Molecule That Made Us and the resources that uh, GBH has published um, and that are also in development. Then uh, Toby Heyman and Toby McElhaney will come on as producers of the resources and show you a sneak peek at some things that are coming. Nancy Gifford will then come on and talk about how she um, is using the resources in her classroom. And she's one of the teacher advisors as we develop these resources. And then I'll come back on for a few final remarks. So I'm gonna turn things over to Sean, thank you. Hi, um, hey, are there any slides between the one that you just showed and this one? Uh, no. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> I will um, wing it then. So, um, if uh, water <laughs> is um, just Wait, a excuse, excuse me, Sean. Maybe I don't know if something got out of order after our rehearsal. I can't imagine how, but um, are you missing something here? Um, yeah, the first three slides about the um, about the show, but um, it's okay. This is this is kind of this is this will be okay. Okay. Um, okay. Do you have the uh, Do you have the video queued up to watch the, or or was it embedded in the slide? Um, well, anyway, I'll just tell you a little about. I'll first start telling you about the um, the show. Um, it's a, a three part series, so three hours, and um, it's a documentary. Um, in a different kind of style, more um, kind of like a podcast style. So it's much more conversational and not as formal as a lot of um, other documentaries are. And the narrator travels around the world and um, just, and gets to see like water, um, how it, its role in all sorts of earth systems and um, in behavior of wildlife, as well as um, societal phenomena. Um, I don't know if we have the clip to show the preview of the... Yeah, Sean, I apologize. Uh, something has changed and um, we're gonna have to, you can see that the next slide is this. Okay, so we, yeah. sorry, we don't have the preview for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, so there are three parts, and um, the first part is uh, the first hour is about um, really the natural world, like how did water get on Earth, um, how is it involved in the different Earth systems, and um, how does wildlife interact with it. Um, the next two parts are um, more about the relationships that humans have with water. Um, the second part really focuses in on um, the, uh, the role water has kind of in, in our history. Um, it may have even had a role in um, our evol human evolution, uh, amazingly enough. And also um, just historically, we know that water um, has played a role in both the development and maybe even the fall of some great civilizations. And then um, kind of segue into um, the third um, episode where we're really thinking about water more as a resource, um, resource management, and um, and just the global and um, and the global political issues that um, water um, that involve water. So it really affects everything from the earth. It takes us from the earth all the way to society and looks at water through a lot of lenses. Just like if you just saw, um, if you were here early enough to see that video um, about the tomatoes <laughs> and um, and really, if you just think about all the products and in, in importing, exporting, we're not just, it's not the products. A lot of times we're, we're actually exporting and importing water because it's such a valuable resource. And so I found that a really interest, one of the many interesting things about this, um, this series that uh, I learned. Okay. So um, even though um, we uh, can't show you the whole thing, um, we have selected um, parts of it uh, to some stories that we can tell that we thought were compelling and that could really help you um, engage kids in phenomena um, that are related to water, but also um, related to key standards and learning goals um, in your science curriculum. Um, the resources that we chose um, relate to both natural phenomena and societal phenomena. So there's a huge range of questions that students can investigate around um, a broad range of topics. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the resources. And um, this first set is um, more about just the role of water in earth systems. And um, this focuses, this particular resource focuses on the Amazon rainforest. And um, it's just fascinating that the, the forest itself affects the local, its, its local weather and climate um, by transpiring so much 
um, the transpiration of so much water. And then this, the image actually isn't the transpiration. It's actually these little microscopic particles um, that, the, that are released by the leaves. And what these act like, these are actually condensation nuclei. So all that water that's in the air um, condenses and forms clouds, which rain. So that's like kind of a really interesting um, illustration of the water cycle. Um, it's kind of a non-typical um, thing. But the condensation nuclei can also be used as a phenomenon for physical science and chemistry when we're talking about um, phase changes as well. Um, so to get to the river in the sky, which is the cool thing about this, is that um, all that moisture laden air um, gets above the Amazon rainforest. Prevailing winds carry it um, away and up in the sky, there's just this river of clouds and water and um, areas in, um, in uh, South America, um, actually that would be arid are now fertile from this river in the sky as it changes the climate for much of Brazil. Um, next slide, please. Um, this other resource kind of builds on that. So it's the same system but then it asks the question, what happens if something changes? In this case, what changed was a really bad drought that um, took maybe, I think, 25% of the trees in the um, Amazon rainforest, which meant not as much water was um, feeding the river. So there wasn't as much water in the river that was um, traveling around. And downstream of that river in the sky, there was also drought um, that affected people. Um, and it was so bad that, so if you look at this image, you're thinking, why are there icebergs in um, South America? Those actually aren't icebergs. That's actually this horrible foam um, that's due to pollution um, from Sao Paulo factories. And the drought because of the drought, the river didn't flow fast enough to wash all of that out into the ocean. And so all of that is just um, nasty foam. So that isn't a COVID mask, that's a hazmat suit that the guy is wearing because they can't even go onto the river without that protection. Um, so that's another, um, besides being able to um, think about the different feedback systems and the interactions between earth systems, um, this is also, a way in to um, discuss human impact on um, the environment. Um, next slide, please. On a happier note, um, we get to dive into um, some migrations, um, an epic migration. Um, we all are familiar, I think, probably with the, the great like monarch migration from Canada all the way down into um, Mexico or even further south. Um, which is pretty amazing. But these dragonflies, they fly from um, India, across the Indian Ocean to East Africa. Um, and uh, they follow the monsoons because they um, like to have, they need the water because the, their young feed on um, mosquito larvae and um, which is also, you know, um, which is fascinating in, in itself in that it provides an ecological service, which is a new term for me, I'm a chemist, um, where the animals are actually controlling the, um, the dragonflies are controlling the, um, the mosquito population and, and the incidence of, of malaria in East Africa. So it's just like this new way of looking at the ecosystems and the interactions between humans and animals. Um, and so uh, even in this really short clip, we, you, these clips you can really um, dig deeply into a lot of different types of um, phenomena. Next slide, please. Um, and then we have a couple resources that focus more on the um, human activity or the relationship between humans and um, water. Um, there's one that focuses on groundwater and aquifers 
and um, how we manage um, that water. And next slide, please. Um, and then another resource that um, Nancy's gonna tell us more about um, how she implements it in her classroom, um, but this resource is about um, how building dams and irrigation um, and how um, we use water that way. Next slide, please. Um, this might be a little inside baseball to you all, but to us, we were really excited um, because we usually make our resources by um, taking the finished product and taking excerpts that we think um, would support uh, the um, learning, support you all in um, helping students meet uh, learning goals. In this case, um, we got to kind of get in on the ground floor before they filmed things and um, actually put in requests so that when they were talking to scientists, we could have them ask extra questions so that they explain more about their data or more about the phenomenon in a way that maybe wouldn't be as engaging to the um, public, but should hopefully um, just give a little extra insight and um, to, to students and a, a fuller picture of the science. Um, next slide, please. Um, so these slides are, um, the, sorry, she skipped my thing. Um, but anyway, these, these stories are great there. Um, we get to see scientists at work um, and they're not in a lab, which I think is great. Um, and also we get to just see the really big questions they're trying to answer um, about earth and, um, and things that are really meaningful to society. Um, but to talk more about these resources and how they were made, I'm gonna turn it over to Toby from TNC and Toby from GVH. Great. Hi all, I'm uh, Toby McElhenney. I'm a video producer at WGBH and, or GBH, excuse me, as we are now known. Um, I'm working with my team here as well as with Toby Heyman at the Nature Conservancy to create these videos that Sean was just referring to where we're not just taking excerpts uh, from the broadcast series, uh, but we're taking material and specifically molding it for your classrooms. Um, this process is meant we've taken about, we've taken material about half of it made the broadcast series, about half didn't. Um, so it's like pretty exciting that it's, you know, it's such fantastic material and, and we're actually able to bring it straight to you and your students. Um, and we get to, we, as Sean said, we get to see science in, in action. We get to get outside of the lab and specifically we get to delve into uh, data collection. So we have uh, one video on uh, tracking animal migrations. You see that uh, photo on the left um, and another one about um, uh, the recovery of the uh, uh, Ella River in the Pacific Northwest. And so these images give you a sense of that you're, you're there with uh, scientists out in the field, um, literally tagging and tracking animals. Uh, these individuals are tracked hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. And then also you're getting into the cold waters of the uh, Elwha River with scientists as they observe and count different salmon uh, populations. Um, why don't we go uh, to the next slide? Um, and in addition to sort of seeing the data collection happening in action, we share some uh, data sets uh, with you and your students. Uh, here's one example on the left where you actually get to see uh, the activity of birds, uh, specifically in um, relationship to uh, uh, human populations. And on the right, um, the uh, you see some of that, this is actually hot off the press data uh, from uh, scientists who are looking at um, the population of a specific type of salmon known as bull trout right before some uh, dam removals and just a few years afterwards. Uh, and this is just to give you and your students a, a flavor for the science that's happening out there. 
I would say that these, what you're seeing right now, leans a little bit more towards general takeaways, but mainly we're just trying to give you a sense of the different types of data sets that uh, uh, signers are measuring and why, and leaving some of the takeaways as well as the connections up to you. And that's, uh, and, and Sean will come back to this because there's support materials to go along with all these videos, but there are lots of connections to be made. For instance, for tracking animal migrations um, uh, and specifically the, um, the relationship to water, for instance, when um, you'll see a little bit a little bit of hint of this in the video as uh, the ice melts in the Northern hemisphere, what, what does this mean in terms of animal migrations? And we just, and then in the video about the Elwha River, we really leave it to you to sort of take the baton and say, okay, we're, we're thinking about the recovery of salmon populations, but what does that mean for other animals such as bear and otters that, were, that um, need salmon to survive or the vegetation communities of the Elwha River watershed at whole, as a whole. And so the support materials will help you do that. Um, and these videos, I think are really just to get, get your students into the field, take these virtual field trips, get them curious, uh, get them to see that science doesn't just happen in a lab, um, get them excited. Um, this has been really fun to work on, but really, you know, the magic of making these videos stand on their own really fell to uh, Toby Heyman at the Nature Conservancy. So I'll hand it off to him and Toby can give you a little sneak peek at uh, these two different videos. Well, yeah, thank you, Toby. Um, yeah, I will just say, you know, what I do at the Nature Conservancy is we, we have a production team and we do all, all of the production. We film, um, we edit, we, we write, we do all the way through. And in, in this case, um, it was just a, a real joy because we had such beautiful footage that was already provided for us. And they shot a lot of great footage uh, that came from the series. And, and then Toby and the rest of the GBH team just made it really easy for me by um, honing down on, on the story and, and really finding the story. So, you know, really a, a, a great experience working on this. Um, but before I say more, let's show a clip. This is um, the, the opening of the migration story. Um, can we play the clip? New technology is providing a window for scientists to understand where and why animals move around the world. When we caught up with Martin Wilkelski, he was busy putting a tracking device on a young giraffe. But it's not just giraffes he is studying. Martin is actually coordinating a worldwide animal tracking revolution. Martin's high-tech miniature tags can relay live feeds via the International Space Station to scientists anywhere in the world. Well done. <laughs> well, on animals, we have these tiny little tags uh, that have a solar panel and a battery and an electronics inside and an antenna. And that can be as a backpack or it can be a, a little ear tag. It's almost like a cell phone. It's a, sort of a modified little cell phone that works on solar power has GPS, acceleration, temperature, uh, humidity, and that is all combined in some little, little digital message and that's being sent to a satellite once that satellite is passing over. And so right after the end of that uh, section, we then see them actually gluing one of those um, little uh, tracking devices onto a fly and and then getting in a plane and, and following the fly because uh, you know with the little tags I think they actually have to physically follow them with planes to track them so it's really fascinating stuff and one of the things that it, I found kind of interesting is that you know you've got this amazing um, PBS series that really is beautiful and tells the story of water but but funnily enough it, it's doing so much that in these educational pieces, we actually kind of go a little deeper into the story and you actually kind of rest with the story a little bit longer. And, and um, in some ways that, that, that was really nice just, just to kind of find out a little bit more because there's so much packed into the PBS show that it, it, it just, it's onto the next thing. Um, and having said that, let's move to the next one. Yeah, this is the, um, you know, for, for the Nature Conservancy perspective, you know, this is uh, a great story because you've got 
uh, a win-win situation where you have these dams that are not helping anybody at the time. And um, by getting rid of them, it, it really, you can really see the amazing things that have happened to the habitat and, and to the communities. And, and um, I'm sure there are uh, some downsides that I don't know about, but from the, the story that I've seen, it's just everyone, everyone it's a success all around. Um, so let's watch this clip, which is a little bit longer than the last piece. The biggest dam removal project ever was completed on the Elwa River in Washington State between 2011 and 2014. After four years, a team of scientists have come to measure if 100 years of negative effects from the dams on the ecosystem can be reversed. With the dams blocking their path from the Pacific Ocean for so long, will the salmon return to the Elwa, their place of origin? So when I first came to the Elwha, I did know that the dams had kept salmon from coming upriver to over 80% of the watershed for almost 100 years. The Elwha dams went in in the 1900s, so roughly 100 years ago uh, the dams were built. And at that time, people built dams to uh, further the development of our society. From a fish's perspective, with the dams in place, they had nowhere to go. They had only very few miles at the lower end of the river. So even though their instinct was to come upstream as far as they could, uh, they would essentially run into a blockade that wouldn't allow them to complete their life cycle in a normal manner. Not being able to pass those dams meant that the salmon were unable to swim further upstream in order to reproduce. But now, the dams have been gone for four years. Christian Torgerson and Betsy Cryer are a part of one of four teams required to be able to survey the entire river. Since the fish are not distributed uniformly, sometimes they are found in relatively few locations. The data collection teams must survey the river foot by foot, mile by mile, observing the riverbed and identifying different species of salmon to get a complete picture. Yeah, so I, I kept on that frame of the of the chart at the end, just because you know one of the things about these videos is we you know we more than than we would in a sort of pure entertainment show we we show the scientists doing the work and and taking notes, and one of the things I really like about this piece is you really get the sense of just how methodical they are and how how much of a task it is to to do this science um so you know and, and, and to see the charts that they make and, and to understand how this um you know this this knowledge can help us uh, make decisions i think is great um so yeah that's that's what i have to say any more toby I, I would just, I just add one more note. I just realized that, you know, folks are mentioning in the uh, chat about the different connections can be made, which is great. And I, and I, I realized that one thing that Toby and I worked um, together on was at the end to make sure that we were able to include uh, some of the voices that of the lower Ella uh, clown tribe. Uh, it, um, that's, you know, we don't go into depth. There, there's the, the Ella story, there's so much there. Uh, but you know, there's there's potential for some cross-discipline uh, curriculum there, and um, you know, we felt it was important to at least at least hear from them. And you, and so, when you see the full clip, you see that uh, uh, we get their voices involved, and and there's another connection for you and your students to make. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'm back. Um, and uh, before I tell you a little about the lesson plans that are um, that go along with these videos, um, I see there is a question about um, the indigenous people, and that's that's really what um, Tubby was just talking about. Um, so in the videos themselves, there's a little bit of that perspective, but in the uh, the support materials um, this uh, that accompany this um, video in the background essay, it does go more um, into depth about um, 
the importance of salmon and um, the natural, the ecosystem in the river um, to the tribe's culture and the, also their role in advocating for the removal of the dams. So um, we wanted to make sure that that perspective um, was included in the resource. Um, so onward to um, the lesson plans. So um, I think everything, um, the lesson plans will be, um, they're not available yet, but they will be available before the end of the year. Um, and uh, this one here, we're gonna first start with the one on migration. Um, and we're gonna, Carolyn's gonna play a video um, of data, and this is bird migration data from um, the database that Martin is building. Um, as you watch this, uh, the, this video, um, think about what, what, are you, what are you noticing and what questions do you have about the data? And if you can, um, throw those things in the chat. Carolyn? Thanks. So each dot or line is one of the, um, a bird with a tag. And each color represents a different species. So, um, I know I had a ton of questions. Like why were the blue, why were the blue dots over on the eastern coast? They never moved. And why do some dots or move and then stop and then move again? Um, and uh, I just find this data fascinating and can look at it forever. Um, so next slide, please. So. Um, for the lesson plan, the kids will get to first learn about this um, migration monitoring project um, from, um, from that other video. And then they'll be able to um, dig a little deeper into the data and have time to actually look at it and look at some of these migration patterns. And then they can formulate their own questions. And then they're going to um, investigate, pick a bird and um, and we'll identify those for you. Um, and um, then they'll investigate its migration pattern and ultimately construct an explanation about the environmental factors um, that affect uh, bird migration. Um, next slide, please. Um, for the, um, to accompany the other video in the um, Elwha River, um, we are kind of disappointed in that um, if you do end up watching the entire series, uh, this story unfortunately got left on the cutting room floor, but it's still a really compelling story. And I'm really glad that we were able to um, make this resource so it didn't get lost. And um, I think that, um, so students will get to um, interpret and analyze a little bit of the recovery data before they um, make an argument about the Elwha um, River um, ecosystem recovery. Um, and I hope that some of the things that we've uh, told you about, it looked like, uh, looks like that we've been able to inspire some of you. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll find these useful. And now Nancy is going to um, go a little bit more in depth and tell you a story about how she would use um, one of these resources in her classroom. Thanks, Sean. Um, so while you were just talking about the Elwha, I was thinking about one of the things that really struck me in that video was where the um, they talk about the importance of the sediment on the salmon's ability to reproduce, which I had no idea. I that was something you know I I grew up on Cape Cod. I know all about fish, but I never knew the, how important the sediment was for their egg laying. So that was something that struck me. And when I'm teaching about these biotic and abiotic factors and ecosystems and how important all of it is, um, it was just another piece that really hit me as being really useful in the classroom. So um, that leads me to 
the, um, the videos that I chose to talk about. Um, and this one is about the Three Gorges Dam, which, you know, we just saw how when you take a dam apart and, and open up that ecosystem, how it can really improve the life of all the animals and all of the, the plants and everything else around and, and the humans as well. Um, Three Gorges is a well-known, um, very different situation where just for the history of people who might not know, um, the dam was built as a response for flood control, but also for hydroelectric power. Um, quite controversial, a lot of people lost their homes in the process. Um, and I've, I asked to start the video a little bit into it. You're, you'll miss about a minute and 15, 16 seconds of it, um, where they just kind of talk about the dam itself and why it was built. And then I think this part that we are showing from the um, minute and 16 second point is really powerful. Um, and the end of it is gonna take your breath away, I guarantee it. So whenever you're ready, Carolyn. It is the world's largest hydroelectric project, generating enough power to supply Beijing with all its electricity needs and stopping the floods downstream. It even has its own boat lift. But controlling all this water comes at a cost. The 400 square miles of reservoir displaced 1.2 million people and caused huge ecological damage. The loss of habitat caused a dramatic reduction in local rainfall. And the weight of water has even caused a 30-fold increase in earthquakes here. Concerned about the environmental impact, scientists use satellite imagery to count the dams across the world and calculate how much water is held behind them. The water in the Three Gorges, for instance, can be represented by a column 1,000 feet wide, rising over 300 miles high. And that is just one dam. China has 87,000 of them. And it's not only China. The United States has almost just as many, 84,000 and counting. Today, two thirds of the world's major rivers no longer have a connection to the sea, endangering fish populations, wetlands, and estuaries. Within 10 years, 93% of all river water will be choked by a dam. There is now so much water stored behind dams in the Northern Hemisphere, the weight of the water has tilted the axis of the planet, affecting the speed of its spin. The way we control water is changing the planet. So wow, right? Um, the, the way that we're controlling the water is changing the tilt and the spin of the earth. That just blew me away. And I think if you wanna talk about human impacts on ecosystems, Wow, right? I just, it just, I, every time I watch that video, I'm, I'm just taking, um, it hits me again, um, just as hard as it did the first time. Um, go ahead, Carolyn, you can go to the next slide. Um, probably should have started with the, um, you know, the construction of the dam and then ended with the feel good story of the opening of the Elwha Dam, because these two are a little depressing, but um, I won't show this video. This is a, a screenshot from the second video in the two, um, videos about water use and a growing population. And this one, this is a picture of the Salton Sea in uh, Southern California. And this uh, area was once known as the Salton Riviera. And it was supposed to be this up and coming place where people could come and live and had great recreational um, opportunities. And the, the, the sea itself is an inland um, briny water uh, lake that was three, 350 miles. Um, in square miles in area. And um, because of the rerouting of the water for agricultural purposes, it is now dr mostly dried up or it just doesn't get the water that it did. So it's a ghost town now. Um, and because the only runoff that gets there is actually runoff from farms, it's considered a biological hazard. So people really can't go there and be there for any length of time. So, um, pretty fascinating um, 
piece of piece of uh, information to teach your kids about how, you know, we may a dam may not seem like it's having an impact where you live, but further down the road or down the river, it'll certainly affect other people. So, um, Carolyn, next slide, please. Um, so the big question is how will we use all of these resources you um, saw tonight? I have been very lucky because I've had a sneak peek at a lot of the resources and they just blow me away. Um, I teach seventh grade this year um, and a lot of my curriculum is around ecosystem science and I'm always looking for ways to teach about the human impacts. Um, and the whole collection really hits on the disruption and the, the restoration, but also just the importance of water in, in ecosystems to the plants, the animals, every kind of life we can, we can possibly imagine. And I saw in the chat, someone was mentioning um, that they could see a lot of use for en uh, engineering as well. So I would love it. Um, we're teachers, we're in a weird situation teaching this year. If you would, if you have any ideas that you wanna share, just pop them in the chat um, so we can see about how we can um, help each other think of ways that we can, can use these resources in our own classrooms. Um, I think that you know we're better together, certainly. Um, one of the things I really like about this collection as well, and all of the PBS resources in science really, is that they show the work of scientists doing science in the field. And um, that's really challenging for us right now. I know I'm, I'm teaching in person uh, this year, but our students aren't allowed to share materials. And so doing labs with them is really challenging. Um, at some point I may be teaching online and like a lot of you I'm sure are, and you're always wondering how, how do you get kids to feel like they're scientists and doing the scientific work. But I think with these resources, it's, it, you can take them on that virtual field trip. You really can't put them on the bus this year and go places, but we can bring the world to them. And I think that's really um, powerful and helping the kids understand um, just how important water is in every aspect of the ecosystem. Um, next slide, please. So from the, um, the, the, the resources. I pulled this right out of the, um, the teacher guide for the video on the Three Gorges Dam. And I highlighted the bottom where it says to make an argument about the Three Gorges Dam. And this really brought me to the practices and thinking about what are we trying to get kids to do? How are we trying to get them to act like scientists? And I think this is the perfect example of now they've learned about the Three Gorges Dam and diverting water from the Salton Sea. What, what's the cost? Is it worth it with the social environmental costs? And how can we get kids to understand that? And, um, you know, at some point in their lives, they may be looking at situations in their own communities that are similar to this, maybe not on the grand scale of the Three Gorges Dam, but it could be anything, building a wastewater treatment plant or whatever it is in their own communities. And I think this experience can help them um, be more informed going forward and, and really understand how to look for the evidence and use it. Um, so every one of the videos has background information and teaching tips like what you see on the screen in front of you, if you're not familiar with that um, setup that they use on the PBS learn learning media. Ellen, I see you, you, you discuss sustainability every day. I do too. Um, this is huge. Um, and if you can go ahead to the next slide, Carolyn. So Laura, I see your question in the chat about using clips. Um, or the whole thing, I, I sometimes will do both. Sometimes I assign the clips for the students to watch on their own um, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Other times I put up um, clips to talk about with my students and we'll play it. I might even stop it and ask questions. A lot of these could be put into a Nearpod or um, you know, Pear Deck or something like that where you can have students responding. Uh, to it as well. But I think with all the resources, there's so much for kids to talk about. And that's really what we want to get them doing is communicating and learning how to communicate that information that they have um, observed. And so um, if you wanted to comment anything about the practices, I made a slide for that as well. Um, I was trying to think, I whenever I look at a resource, I'm like, okay, what practices are, are hit with this? And there's so much in, this, in these clips and in the whole collection where really it's all about asking the questions and using the models and in, in the investigations. And I love that the um, Elwha River 
had the visuals of the data and um, and analyzing that data put right into the clip. So you could pause that video, grab a screenshot and put those video or those graphs side by side so the kids can make those connections as well. Um, and that's one of the things I, I feel like is very important for our students right now is understanding how to access data, deciding what's important and then how will they use that to support what they, their claims or decide if um, some of that, those claims are, or the, that evidence they're seeing is, is valid and what they wanna use. Um, but, you know, just to kind of sum it up for me, I, I would say that this collection gets to the heart of the importance of water um, in every person's life, for sure. Um, and I think it'll get students thinking about water in a way that they hadn't before. And I know for myself, you know, I, I live near the ocean. I'm, I live next to a pond. I'm constantly doing something related to water. I'm always trying to find water to walk on or swim in or sail on or whatever. Um, but this collection puts it in a whole new perspective, um, seeing how it Im impacts everybody across the world. And I have one more slide to show you. Um, go ahead, Carolyn. Um, on the PBS website, I found a link. If you go to the PBS website, there is a, a molecule that made us page. Um, and there's some resources there. And this was a, um, an infographic that I pulled right off of that page. And I thought this was really interesting um, to have the kids talk about. And this ties right back to that video that we saw at the very beginning. Um, one of the things that really struck me was that eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper making, um, and it, it took a half a gallon to three gallons to to produce that one one sheet of paper and how many times do you see kids write one thing on it throw the whole thing away and and throw it in the trash um so you know we don't really think about paper and water necessarily and the pair of jeans that's all through the production to create that one pair of jeans was 26 bathtubs full of water um, also on that website and i have the link on the slide but we can um sean's got it up on the on the chat for you, there's a water footprint calculator um, right on the website that you can access and, and do with your kids so they can think about their own water use. Um, so that's that's all I have tonight. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have, but I know she, uh, Carolyn had a few things she wanted to say um, to wrap things up. But yes. please feel free to keep yeah. putting ideas in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, all presenters, um, this is, uh, and for the attendees, this is your um, opportunity if you'd like to post other questions in the chat. And as we're winding down, uh, the presenters could respond. Matul has been doing a great job getting links to you. We're going to be sending a follow up email tomorrow to everyone who registered. And in that email will be a link to this recording a link to the slides. I think she also has the link to the slides to post tonight, um, a resource document that has all the links compiled in one place, et cetera. So that uh, follow-up email will come out tomorrow. Uh, so the three hour broadcast, um, and there is a website. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in the beginning, the molecule that made us, but the three hour broadcast um, is available now if you are a public television member of your local station and a part of Passport. So it's available there. It's also available, I just checked out today on Amazon Prime for a small fee. And uh, March 10th coming up, um, it will be broadcast on the World Channel, which is available in many states across the country, not all, but I would check your local listings to see uh, the World Channel, and that will be broadcast March 10th, the full three-hour uh, program. Uh, so um, this is just a reminder that everything you saw tonight, all the resources are available in PBS Learning Media along with thousands of other resources. Um, again, this site is for uh, all educators, K-12 across the curriculum, but we are very strong in science. And that in part, of course, is because of the productions of um, NOVA and, the, and our other science projects that GBH is involved in. 
Uh, PBS Learning Media is a co-production between GBH and PBS, and the resources that are published on the site not only come from GBH, but come from other stations and other projects, uh, public media projects across the country. Um, so I didn't want to leave you with thinking that, um, you know, the only thing you're going to find on the site is uh, the molecule that made us. There are many other collections of resources and a couple that I wanted to highlight. I've already mentioned Nova. There are, um, I think I, I have the number and I think, it, yeah, over 1500 resources uh, from NOVA on PBS Learning Media that are coming from the NOVA broadcast as well as uh, NOVA digital productions. I also want to uh, make sure you know about Bringing the Universe to America's Classrooms, which is another collection on PBS Learning Media. This is a uh, collaboration with NASA and GBH. Uh, we have produced um, resources on, for Earth and space science, drawing on NASA data, NASA imagery, et cetera, and other um, sources of media to create these uh, resources for K-12 on Earth and space science topics such as weather and climate, water, earth formations, um, solar system, et cetera. So we invite you to... Um, go on the site and look for both of those collections, as well as Nova Wonders. Nova Wonders was um, a six part series on um, public television, and it examines some of the biggest questions about life and the cosmos, burning questions such as, uh, can we build a brain? What's the universe made of? What are animals saying, etc. Fascinating stuff. And nature. Um, this iconic program that's been on forever, produced by WNET out of New York. Um, in the collection, there are a group, um, many, many science videos and media enhanced lesson plans. So that's just um, four examples of other collections um, on PBS Learning Media. We run a lot of webinars in the GBH education department and we record everything and we publish all of the edited recordings on the GBH education YouTube page. And that's where the recording of this will be published tomorrow. Um, so you're welcome to go there and also um, uh, share the information with your colleagues. Our research department, uh, puts together a survey for all of our work. And we really do listen to your feedback and try and do better. So please um, take the survey. Uh, it's very short. We'll put the link in the chat. It's also in the um, resource document that you're gonna get tomorrow. Uh, at the end of the survey, if you'd like, you can download a certificate acknowledging your participation um, in this webinar. And uh, the survey typically stays open for about 10 days. We are very active on social media, so please follow us. You can see our handle GBH Education. And I want to thank you. I want to thank um, our presenters, Sean and Nancy Gifford. Uh, Toby Heyman, Toby McElhaney, and also Matul in the background. This is my email, Carolyn Jacobs. I'm a GBH education. You are welcome to email me with any questions you have about the presentation. If you'd like to get in touch with the presenter, if your questions weren't answered, whatever. So um, we know how challenging these times are for everyone. We are in constant awe of teachers and your dedication and your effort that you're doing to keep things going and make it happen for your students. And we wish you the best um, health, good health and um, a very nice Thanksgiving.